Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Live Thrivingly podcast. Today's guest was born in the Philippines, and one month after her birth, her mother immigrated to the U.S., leaving her and her father behind for a year to earn money to bring them back to the U.S. with her. She was raised in Yonkers, New York, and currently resides there now. Let's just say she is nothing short of highly qualified, well-educated, and a seasoned traveler. She received her bachelor's in nursing at Dominican University in Orange County, New York, and graduated from Holistic Nursing School at the Pacific College of Oriental Medicine's online portal. We might be here all day if I list off all of her certifications, but to name a few, she is a 500-hour RYT with a diverse range of styles and niches from Ashtanga to chair yoga, yoga for kids to yoga for cancer. She is a breathwork facilitator, an Ayurvedic yoga massage therapist, and a level two Reiki student. Through her own self-healing journey, she guides others to release trauma, open their hearts, and find safety within their nervous system. She currently works one-on-one -on -one with clients in small groups, building wellness programs for corporate companies, supports healthcare workers through TRE and neurogenic yoga, hosts and facilitates wellness retreats, and fuels her social entrepreneurship side by owning her own private practice and cacao company. I am honored to introduce you to my dear sister, China D. Andrada. Thank you so much for having me here today. Such a long list. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for making time and space for the show today. Of course, of course. So just to kind of get it kicked off, imagine that you're stranded on an island and you get three items. What are these three items? Okay, what are these three items? I would say, I don't know why it comes up, but a, I would have a book and I don't know what book, but definitely a book, um, whether it is something to read or to write with, I would have matches, some fire, and the last one, I say, Rope. rope yeah yeah what's the strategy with that you get a little you get a little campsite going get yeah. a fire get a a little bit of mind simulation with something and a fire for you know food or even like for some reason also offerings came to my mind yeah um and also the rope is to help build things and hold structure Wow. Yeah. Good items. Good choices. <laughs> what would you pick? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a it's a tough question for me. Um, I think rope is definitely on there. Uh, probably a, a hatchet or machete. Um, and then. Hmm. Maybe like a like a stove pot for like boiling water and like cooking foods and things. Love that. Yeah. So I want to take a moment to reflect on the intro a little bit. Like, wow, your mom is such an inspiration for making a sacrifice like that. Oh yeah. And it took me a long time to really realize it actually, how much she's played this enormous role in my life and it's funny because we're both Aries and we have a similar uh, birthday like her birthday was yesterday on March 30th and mine's in like a couple of days so I used to kind of think that we were the same so we butt heads but in reality she's been such a mirror in my life and like you said that sense of sacrifice is something I have really embraced as an adult now that I'm here and she's a huge reason why I'm walking the path I'm walking. Oh, that's so beautiful. 
I know we've shared a lot of conversation before, but I would really love to hear you speak more about your um, life journey. Uh, what was life like prior to your healing journey and what led you down the path that you walk today? So life before healing, I think it was right before. So part of the opening of me starting this healing journey was like at 19. Um, prior to that in middle school, I was a really big athlete. I loved basketball and it was really a big, huge pinnacle part of my life was playing basketball, um, even through high school. And I think that part was the happiest I feel as an athlete in my life. But aside from that, I was going through a lot as a younger child, um, but I loved playing outside. I was always outside playing with friends or in nature. If to this day you ask me any movie, any music, any artist, I don't know. Because when I was younger, I was never indulged in any TV or phone, anything like that. So a lot of my life has been outside playing and just enjoying nature and just enjoying, you know, just being around a lot of friends at that moment. So that was a big part of my life, I feel, um, that I enjoyed so much before healing. And yeah, I mean, as teenagers going into college, you kind of get into the wrong people and started diving into, you know, a lot of like drugs and alcohol. So that also played another aspect. It's like this duality of like goodness into doing things that shed a lot of darkness in my life. And yeah, it's just playing this balance between both polar opposites, which was really, really difficult. But also, I do remember all of those amazing times that I've enjoyed as a child. So also embracing all aspects of my life when I was younger before healing. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's important to take note of and, and to to store and to reflect on those times, especially when we begin to walk the self-healing path, because it can definitely seem um, never ending at times. And like, it just keeps hitting you with floods of, you know, new perspectives and, and deeper awarenesses of, of, of wounds and, and things like that. So, yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about that time around, you know, you were saying you were around 19 and, uh, the drugs and alcohol and, and um, sex and things like that were really coming into your life at that point. Yeah. So at 19, I was at college at Dominican University. And um, as you had mentioned earlier, my mother and father are from the Philippines. And a lot of our culture stems with like nursing. That's just what it is. It's like it's shared as nursing is one of the best professions you can do. It's a stable job. You have a pension when you're done. You can take care of your family. And it's just this center of stability, which I understand because, you know, immigrant families try to shift to coming to the US to find opportunities to find jobs because in a third world country, you just can't don't have those opportunities at all. So um, stability, I had realized, especially with my family and those generations and the scarcity mindset was very strong as a belief. And, you know, I'm so grateful because I've had the privilege of having a home and they've given me this whole entire life. Um, and they wanted to kind of continue that sense of stability. So as their first child um, in my head, going to school, be a nurse. And, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do at 18. No one usually does. So I decided to just go. And I actually think it accepted my first year. Um, and that was the biggest reality check for me. Um, and if I can think of what I was doing at like 18, like you mentioned before, I was um, doing a lot of drugs. Sometimes I would go to class a little high. I would go to class a little drunk because I was drinking. And I think part of the responsibility of like acknowledging that I didn't give it my all 
was a really huge bruise to my ego because I think when I was younger mentioning like with basketball and school, like I was always a top A student or I would strive to be the best. And then once I hit like college, it just didn't matter to me or I was just really infused with all of the drugs, alcohol and sex then around me. And I just, it was such a blur and not getting accepted was just this opening door of like, what are you doing with your life? And I kind of went down this whole tunnel of starting to reflect back on like my teenage years and even prior to that. And I just got into this really dark hole. I got extremely depressed. I remember just not even eating well because we were in school and this continuous of like a self doubt and now I'm not now I'm not good enough and my parents didn't get really mad at me and just always this constant um, bashing that I had gotten to a point where I was writing a letter to myself and to my family on like why I would possibly want to leave this earth and I got it got really bad that I was like, I think I need to actually ask my mom as a one last, it was almost like a one last call for help. And I spoke to her and, you know, she, she's also a nurse and she was just really calm, actually took it really well, wasn't, wasn't freaking out or anything like that. And was just saying, why don't you come home? Let me go up and was almost at least for me was one of the first times that I felt like my parents actually stepped up in a way that didn't feel like I was in trouble because I feel like I got in trouble a lot as a child. So that sense of trust was really um, slightly shattered or wasn't formed properly. But I think at a point you get really desperate when you don't know if anyone's around and the first one's your mom. And as time went on, she, I had asked her, I think I really need to see a psychiatrist. And through that, you know, the first step in like a Western lens is like, okay, you gotta get put on meds. It's like almost a stabilization, um, get on medications. And, you know, my mom actually decided like, no, I don't think that's like a good first step. So um, we actually decided to do yoga and it was initially hot yoga. And we did that for a couple, um, yeah, a couple of months. And then my father actually joined. And then, you know, my mom, dad, they love it. They still do it till this day. So um, it really became a huge gateway for my family and for me. Um, and as I continued like this hot yoga, at first it was good physically and mentally at the moment in the beginning was great. And then as I started growing my practice and um, my mental health just declined and I didn't know why. And like, I not to say that there were teachers who weren't there to support, but I think it was just out of the realm of their scope of practice. So I was like, wow, now this is not working. Nothing's gonna help me. And um, and yeah, in those moments, like I was really confused. And again, I was like, I feel like I'm teetering back down into this space that um, felt again, familiar and dark. And then my mom was like, she had actually gone to her teacher training. She did a teacher training up north in Rishikesh and I was curious and I was like, oh, good for you. It was not in my realm. Like I didn't want to do that, but she was raving about it. She was like, you should do your teacher training. I think it would, it opened uh, her eyes. Like it's not just yoga poses and it's not just this one thing that you have to achieve because at that moment, right? Coming as an athlete background, I was like, oh, I can do these handstands. I can do these back bends. I can do all these amazing cool poses. And I think it was like a small dose of like, it was like a small dose to my ego. And it was not actually fully healing me in a way that I needed to be supported, maybe just as a quick fix. Um, but that's when I realized I actually have to dive a little bit deeper 
So she was like, why don't you look for a teacher training? And at that point, I was doing a little bit of Ashtanga and I wanted to learn a little bit more about it. So I did some workshops here in New York. I'm like, maybe it is Ashtanga and Hatha something I want to do. Remember, I came from like a hot yoga and I only knew knew the 26 poses and um, a little bit of vinyasa. But yeah, I kind of was stuck. I really love the Shanga. I love the consistency of it, but there was growth in the other series. So I decided to go and I went to Goa in India and she sent me there for six weeks and it was so much fun. I, again, it was this whole transformation for me. And it just after after my first yoga teacher training, I realized the love I have for learning just in general on more of like the non-nursing side like nursing for some reason when I was in school in college it was so stressful like I did not know how to manage my stress but then when I was going to school for like yoga or like the breath work or anything um, around like energy work it was really exciting so I was at this point in my life and I was like I like this, but I'm doing nursing. What am I going to do? And it was holding these two balls for a long time. And I finished college, got my first nursing career. I worked as a pediatric oncology nurse. And in that time, in the beginning of my career, I was still doing yoga. I decided to open up a yoga studio. So using the stability of all of the income that I had as a nurse, and I was like, I want to do what I want to do and it's yoga and I ended up opening up a yoga studio in New York and yeah I had that for you know I had one co I subleased from a uh, Pilates studio and I just ran it out of that for a couple of years and then I ended up getting my own large studio and then it from there I you know I realized I loved holding space for people with the yoga studio and in between um, since I worked in a pediatric oncology I wanted to do yoga for cancer I was trying to find these niches and I think part of the learning and especially when it comes to yoga like you have to try a lot of things because there are there there are so many people who know this and I had come to realize I just can't like handle everyone. And that was almost almost a really good thing for me to realize because I, I felt like at that point I had a really big heart and I wanted to just have yoga for everyone. But knowing ages, different lifestyles, we just have to find the ones that we can connect with. And, you know, being able to have all of these different skill sets, you can be able to micro create whatever you know niche that you want for a certain person and i think that's like the beauty of learning so many things is because you can encompass all of your skills and knowledge and then create something for this one person and it's just only for them so um yeah i opened the yoga studio and during the pandemic had closed it so i'm actually it's a blessing in disguise because like you mentioned earlier, I love to travel. And part of me traveling was also a huge part of this healing journey. Um, Learning so many new modalities, meeting so many new people, um, continue to just like build this like fire inside of me. And it was almost like we were, I was, I was getting torches from other people's light and being able to share that same light to others. And I think that is something that I want to continue doing for the rest of my life and serving um, is to continue having this like endless light of love that I feel like our world fully needs. So serving as a nurse was one place, but I think I don't want to be stuck in a little bit of this box or, you know, corporate hospital so being able to expand and have all these other skills and you know find abundance in other ways is something you know i i think i've really really enjoyed yeah amazing so cool how you from the place you were at and with your mom's guidance how you ended up 
in India at your first training. And then it just really started picking up speed from there. And, uh, you know, you had that nursing piece still, and then the yoga studio for a while, but you know how that's all kind of been written chapters in your life. Um, to the point you are now on the, on the topic of kind of nursing and stuff, I would just want to know your perspective. Um, maybe like advice to to nurses out there today that are also very much into the holistic side um because i i've met a lot of them out there and i'm i i want to know maybe some advice from your perspective on that yeah um so it's interesting because i feel like if i were and i'm gonna just come from experience so obviously like i mentioned before a lot of it came from like my culture but i feel like it's like an overall culture you're a nurse you make money you do well there's options you're flexible you can move in different programs and i think that is like key to understand like as a nurse is that you have the ability to actually move to different things like you could be a nurse like lawyer you can be in business, you can be an entrepreneur, you can do outpatient, inpatient, like there are possibilities, like it's there. However, um, I think the the stigma of like, oh, it's just for the money and you're, I think when it comes certain to like money, really sit with your decision if this is the, if this is what you want to do. Because I've seen many nurses enter as a, go through four or five years of nursing school, do one whole entire year of it and completely leave the career, Um, which, you know, I left bedside and I I understand that because my true intention was like, I just needed the money for whatever I wanted to do with my life. Um, And part of it is like, if it is for the money, that's okay. And don't forget about like who you are and what your dreams are. Um, that being said, is that a lot of times, especially as nursing students, if you could develop a way to manage stress already and create this really strong, strong foundation prior to even going into your first year as a nurse, that is something I truly wish someone had shared, or even the realities of trauma. And when I'm talking about trauma, this is like compassion fatigue. This is burnout. This is consistently holding um, your moral values against other families or against a hospital. So it's not talked about ever, especially when it comes to like the moral value sense. It's like you may believe something, but a patient and their family might not. So you're constantly battling this sense of morality and a lot of trauma happens and we're never ever taught how to deal with it. We're taught it's only the patient and it's only you, which yes, their safety, their life matters. But I think nurses in general, when they're talking about holistic, they have to come to the realities. Like you work in an environment that is traumatic. And if you do not fill yourself up, if you do not, Renourish yourself and i'm not talking about going on vacation and then coming back and oh, I have to do this all over again it's truly integrating in your life. What are the small things that I need to do, what are the larger things I need to do and create this strong foundation because it is such a difficult field to be in you're always tested and. Um, I think. Once a person or a nurse can respect themselves, I feel like at a point that's when larger companies, hospitals, bosses, or coworkers start to respect us and I uh, start to respect a nurse just because it's a reflection, right? Um, I remember, I don't know who I was when I was, the last three years as a nurse, I was a completely different person because my nervous system was always on fight or flight it which has to be and i'm a very big advocate on fight or flight is not bad fight or flight is there for a reason and i can't be mindful about okay i'm gonna give you your meds all right and then here i'm gonna go walk very slowly to i need the fight or flight for an automatic to get through my daily tasks 
So being able to witness when is my pause? When do I need a pause for this um, fight or flight? Just to kind, of, just to kind of recharge or even take a second, because once you're in this overdrive, sometimes someone's foot is so strong on the pedal that that's when we start losing control. And then, um, yeah. So I think like as a nurse, especially with like holistic practices like really preach like really do your practices or really come in a space that you can look at everything in your whole entire life and at a point you do have options if you ever want to leave and I think um, options doesn't necessarily have to mean nursing you can um, create different programs and it's really your will um, some people are just like, oh, you, you, you're just doing what you do because um, you don't have kids or you don't have a family or you don't get it. You don't have you don't have a house. And at a point, it's like self responsibility for everyone. You are where you are if you stay there. Um, and no one said decisions are easy. So um, I think a lot of hard choices happen because we're engulfed in like this this scarcity mindset so also um if you do decide to leave this sense of career it's really again i think a stabilized structure and foundation is important allocating or saving or moving your money where it needs to go um there there's endless amount of ways but um yeah i think yeah. i'm on a little tangent <laughs> no no it's it's great stuff and i i just have to say i mean from the nurses i know or the the nurse the the people i know in nursing school is like y'all have such a heart for humanity and for for healing people and you know that's really your soul's calling coming in to to that space you know and and sometimes especially in the western world like it's almost like you're kind of geared toward maybe not just culturally or stability wise toward nursing, but you're called to it because you want to help others and stuff and, and you can hold space for those people. But like you said, they don't, you're not taught the the correct methods. You're not given the correct tools to help you deal with the trauma and the stresses that come from constantly working in an environment like that. And from many of the people I've talked to in that space, uh, it's come to a point where their cup is overflowing and they they didn't know how to release all that they have been taking in, especially if you're uh, a more empathetically geared person and you're absorbing these emotions to be able to have something like neurogenic yoga, yoga in itself, you know, smudging, uh, walking exercise, anything that you're able to release. But you know, also not just from a full striving standpoint, like you, like you said, with Ashtanga, like getting home and just go, 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 but actually creating that pause for yourself to, to really sit with yourself to get clear again, to remove anything that's not yours. And so that you can properly, you know, see where you are and, and your vision of where you want to go. And that's beautiful that you've pulled through, you know, whether you want to stay in the career or, go to a new place, but to, to kind of understand that there is options, you know, there's a lot of directions you can go. It's, it is a great space to be in and it can be very financially rewarding, but, you know, have that stability and have that vision of where you want to go and those dreams you would still like to pull through. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, if anyone who is interested in like holistic nursing and Pacific college, if you have an associate's degree, they do a bridge program for BSN which is amazing. Not many places do that. So, you know, associates is about a, two years or less. So say you're thinking about it and go for your associates, work a little bit. Maybe you're not making amazing money, but it's again, we need to think of our basic needs. Are you eating? Are you living? If that's a yes, you're fine. Or you're feeding your family. I think, I think that was the biggest thing for me to release like a scarcity mindset as a nurse. It's just like, do I have my basic needs in check? And if they are all checked, I'm fine. Um, I don't need to worry about the future right now. Um, although it is also always there for us to think about our future, especially if you have a family. And um, but it's it's like what we have right now. And you know, associates, and then if it is holistic, you know, there are herbal programs 
there are um there are energy work programs there's a lot of reiki studies that are that are coming out now so you know i think maybe it's not going to get accepted now like a different eastern view but i think people are a little bit at, at this moment more open to it and it doesn't have to just come from the western and it's unfortunate because insurance doesn't cover it, and i think that's the biggest aspect just insurance purposes but other than that people would be so into it um but yeah, so Pacific College actually offers a bridge program that you can actually get a bachelor's in holistic nursing, take the same, pretty much the same classes you would or you would in a nursing school, and you know, have like a certification so you can develop wellness programs. There's wellness programs out there. I think um, we get very strong on traditional uh, nursing is bedside, um, but when I research, there's tons. And again people can work online you can work for corporations you can work for endless amount it's just the willing and the patience and the research i think part people just want oh tell me what to do or like give me an outline you have to kind of research because it's a it, it's a niche thing uh, certain people want to do especially with holistic again there's so many realms of holistic does that look like nutrition? Does that look like energy work? Does that look like herbal medicine? Um, so it's also when you experience it yourself. And I think that's what I mean about um, practice what you preach. If so, you know, really diving as a person and creating this holistic lifestyle and then share it and then say, hey, you know, this helped me because it's almost like you want to experiment with yourself to see if it really works. You don't want to, oh, I heard a yoga is great, so we should do it, or you should do it, and just you know not fully embrace and indulge and experience it yourself. Um, that goes for Reiki and energy work and all of those herbals. So it's just like true experience, see your trial and error, and then expand from there. And then it's almost like you have your own evidence base. And I think that's a lot, especially when it comes to like Eastern medicine. It's like we hear the stories, we hear other people, and it's this sense of faith and belief. And that's what it goes through because you can't do full on studies with these things. They just you don't do it. Um, and yeah, I think that would be really great to just know that there are there is like a program that exists just mm -hmm. like Pacific College to do something like that, even if you just want to dabble in nursing and doing a quick associates and get your bachelor's. And do you do you see in the near future, the next five to 10 years, like a move toward more like openness toward holistic, like medicine, holistic lifestyle, like in the Western world and that there will be greater opportunities to expand within the, the space? In the next five years, no. I think, I think it's, I think what, what it is is that, or at least the change that needs to be happen is, um, it's almost like rebuilding beside them, if that makes sense. It's like you have the corporations that have all these money, power, whatever, et cetera. And there's no, we, there's no way we can continue to just fight or go against that. And, you know, yes, we can to a certain degree, right? Like you can have your nurses' rights, you can change your contracts, you can keep doing all of these little things and negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. But introducing another realm of lens is tricky just because I guess, I spoke about like the insurance purposes and maybe like the openness and the schooling of medical doctors and the schooling of nurses in Western. Like, I just feel like the structure until like the schooling aspect gets a little bit broadened, I don't see it actually happening on the field. It has to be from the root up when it's professionals being shared. Um, all that, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think that does. And I think you're right when you say it's it's going to have to happen from the roots up and build alongside what's already there. And I think that there's always going to be a place and a space for the, I mean, we're not getting rid of 
the Western medicine and the Western, you know, Never. like, Never. and it's amazing. Don't theories. Yeah. It, it medicine, saves lives. And exactly. So, but at least even in my own area, like there's a cool place in Fort Worth, Texas down the road for me called restore and revive. And it's literally a place full of like different practitioners that do all sorts of stuff from lymphatic drainage to dry needling to massage to ayurvedic yoga like yoga ayurvedic yoga red light therapy ionic foot soaks ivs so you know there's there's little places popping up i think all over that you know if those can continue to build in their audiences and more people can open their minds to it and also go experience it for yourself like you said and and feel what changes happen in their body, what changes happen in their life, their family's lives. That's when it really, I I think, collects more speed and and more energy behind it. Yeah. And, and I think having those places is almost like that, you know, that, that extra step build being built next to it. Um, Maybe, you know, maybe there is a collaboration that, that they can work together. I feel like if, you know, Western lens, Eastern lens lens that really can intertwine in some way, or at least be an option for people to understand and know that there is that option, it will do great wonders because I've seen chemotherapy save kids. I've seen, um, you know, so like surgery help people antibiotic like these are things that I know I'm not I'm never going to disregard the amount of quickness and um, direct western medicine can do because it does like there are great wonders and new things that are happening and it's unbelievable you can't even like imagine but I think part of the holistic is also knowing that that exists but other realms of your life exist and it's like what's at home um and what's your spirituality what's your emotional what's your mental and also considering that and i think when you can see it all together in this one piece um it's almost like this relearning and um re-understanding and i think that's just what life is this is like relearning re 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 un- realizing and being open um and yeah yeah, so shifting gears a little bit, let's tell us a little bit more about this beautiful plant medicine from Mesoamerica, Theobroma cacao, that you came across during your journey. Uh, <laughs> Theobroma cacao. Yeah. Uh, so as I was studying, um, so I, like I mentioned before, I had gone to like India and did my first 200 uh, registered yoga teacher training at Himalaya Yoga Valley. I loved my anatomy and ph- ph- philosophy teacher, Adam Devine and um, Viriam. They are married and us, I, I stood with them for a while. The beautiful thing about that school is that they have a place in India and then they also have a place in Ireland. So when I couldn't go back to India, which I went a couple of times, I would go to Ireland so I can maintain the relationship and education. And he introduced me to more of like the traumatic and neurogenic Tremors is how it kind of got that gate opened. He taught emotional anatomy and also the Ayurvedic yoga massage. And while one of the trips in Ireland, I actually was given cacao from a friend. And it was very casual night. We were just hanging out and we were doing some tarot card readings. And in the readings, it it was just like really calling. And the reading was so profound when we were like reading just from the book. It wasn't like a true reading. It was just us girls, girlfriends hanging out. And I was just sipping the cacao casually. And then a little, maybe like 30 minutes, an hour, it was like this profound sensation of like gratitude. It was like gratitude about just me being with a friend. And I haven't felt that in a really long time. And it, it, it was almost 
jarring. <laughs> it was almost too like this is good, too good to feel right now because um, I didn't even know I had the capacity to feel that sense of like self love. And um, I think that was like a very big curiosity to cacao and I cry and really happy that night like really happy and this full sense of gratitude I was like what was that sensation what was that feeling and you know as time goes by I you know developed this sense of relationship with uh, cacao and I call her her um, because she is a uh, essentially all plants have spirits in them and um, the cacao spirit I built this beautiful relationship with her and all of a sudden I was like really thinking about um, when I was transitioning from bedside to building my own business, the one on one um, practice, I was like, I do want to have something online, um, meaning like I wanted like an e commerce or whatever it may be. I went through all of the paths I went through. Should I do yoga mats? Should I do yoga blocks? Should I do straps? Should I do clothes? And just kind of thinking of all these things. And then I was like drinking cacao. And I was just like, I really just wish I'm going to sit here and wish like, what would come to my mind to share with the world? I don't want to just this quick materialistic thing, something that really this world needs. I'm drinking, I'm sitting. And then I'm like really tasting the flavors. Like, really tasting the flavors and I'm like oh my goodness I think I'm ready to share cacao and I was like a little hesitant though it was almost like it was almost like you it was almost like this codependent relationship it's like no I just want you to stay with me for a little bit because you're so good to me and I was like okay you know what let me just kind of share it with a couple people and share it with my family share it with a little bit of friends and I was like am I really crazy like to to share this and then I kind of started researching and then I was like really researching and I was like ceremonial cacao and I started diving into it and I was like this is a thing and like it just you know I I've never really realized and from there on I was just like I want to share this medicine um because of the relationships I've had and already automatically intertwining it in my holistic modalities like breath work or anything like that but really drinking it intentional and being with myself even creating a ceremony that I didn't know I made right and when we're just talking about ceremony it's just like a gathering and an intention and um yeah and then I was like I think I'm just gonna do it after already opening one business a year later I decided to share sage cacao and i opened this online cacao business in new york where i'm still living now and i ended up finding um two amazing companies because i did reach out to multiple cacao companies to just kind of build relationship and to get on to uh, to get an understanding about who they are and what their values are morals and what they want to do with the future and I came across two beautiful companies uh, one called cacao love which is with Gavin and Diane and one called cacao source which is with um, Dorothy, Jordan, and Laurence and they are based in Guatemala and Diane and Gavin are based in the UK so i ended up partnering first with diane and gavin for cacao love and they share their peruvian cacao and they have um, a collective down in peru and they're beautiful humans they're musicians they actually help this nonprofit in africa and as we know majority of our chocolate more than 75 percent of our chocolate comes from Africa, especially in the Ivory Coast. And, you know, there's a dark side to that. And I started really diving a little bit deeper, um, understanding um, on a cultural level, like, oh my God, this is where our chocolate comes from. And we're talking about, um, we're talking about uh, A, deforestation, ruining the earth. B, there's child slavery. C, we're also giving poor conditions for these farmers. They will never sustain a lifestyle ever. Um, and it's a billion dollar company. 
So it really, you know, starting to understand and having this almost veil relief from my head was like, wow, it's just more than this medicine for my own self healing for humanity's self healing. It's actually like a global, like dent into our society. And um, through them, um, I started selling a lot of like their Peruvian cacao. And then I went to Guatemala and met Cacao Source. And they sourced from um, Guatemala, where uh, they have now, I believe, four, four, is it four single origins now? Yeah, I think four single origins, maybe five. I think they're working on their fifth. Um, yeah, and for them, what they did was they sourced from small scale farmers, pretty similar to like these collectives, but they actually built um, a foundation for the indigenous people living there. And then it opened up more of like the Mayan cosmovision and also like the history on like what cacao was used for um, as a medicine. So being able to see this whole holistic view on just, you know, what we know as chocolate um but really understanding that from the chocolate we know now stems from this really beautiful theobromine cacao tree that um has the capacity to replenish the land has the capacity to replenish communities and then also like replenish us and that that is the pinnacle of like holistic for me um especially because the density of nutrients in that one bean is like a superfood comes from my side of like a nurse and then the spirituality side um it's like remember that essence and spirit inside of cacao it's like there is this place of spirituality where you can find that spark and then like your purpose and it always getting fueled through like self-love and nourishment and understanding and even courage and passion because like I said we're walking through darkness so part of it is to continue this torch of sharing that light and I believe cacao can really do that so it's been this like weird journey of like me having it and then the readiness of like sharing it because I actually you know I didn't know a lot about it. And I think um, because chocolate's such a big part in our life, it's so big. It, it's almost like now I see chocolate everywhere 10 times more because of the cacao company. Mm -hmm. And it's only growing. It's only a growing business. Um, it's only a growing um, market. But it's really just bringing in a space of, again, your ethics and morals towards it. Um, so yeah, I really really enjoy sharing it and it and i think for me at least to be able to share it with others um is through an individual like i think um i think once a person can actually find a sense of safety in their vulnerability or a safety to actually open up to others is the only way as a collective, we can hold hands together and connect. Um, so starting with as an individual and it can only expand from there. So um, that's really how cacao really just molded into my life. <laughs> yeah, wow. Thanks for sharing. That's actually where I got the pleasure of meeting China was down in Guatemala. She did a second training with Cacao Source. She had been the first year and so met her and her team with sage cacao michael michelle and erica her sister and uh also a lot of other beautiful human beings from around the world that we got to share space with and learn with so isn't everyone just so amazing our group was great i love them yeah i hope some of them are listening to this episode today um and more of them will come on as well so that's that's amazing thank you for sharing about cacao and how it's affected you and uh, how you're using sage cacao and kind of your sharing of cacao to help something much bigger than your individual journey and your work with cacao, you know, how it ripples into like global change, like you mentioned, you know, carbon absorption from the atmosphere. We're talking superfood from a nutritious standpoint for the body, um, uh, emotional medicine, spiritual medicine. I mean, it's so all encompassing. I know me and you have shared a lot of conversations that if we were to talk about cacao, you would need 
days upon days because there's just so much to it. And we're kind of relearning a lot of these things that have been lost through the colonization of of cacao and the chocolate industry as we dig back into the roots, literally and figuratively, to rediscover what this medicine might do on a much broader scale. And it's it's also just a an amazing plant medicine for like an introductory kind of um, plant medicine for people that are looking into um, other plant medicines. I think it's a great meeting point. Yeah, absolutely. And it is part of one of those um, plant medicines that everyone, you know, hears about. And it's amazing because it's, I, I like to share cacao almost when in comparison, let's say um, mushroom as a psychedelic, I love to say cacao when when we're sitting on a cliff, um, when you're consuming cacao, it's almost like you're dangling your feet and then you can actually on your terms go off the cliff and almost embrace the depths of whatever you want to embrace. Sometimes when you do like stronger medi- uh, plant medicines, whether it's like psychedel- uh, psychedelic mushroom, bupo, or like ayahuasca, that you're automatically like just kind of drop there. So it's like, like you said, an introduction in a space, it's like that trust and safety. It's really like building that solid trust to yourself and be, having the ability to create safe environments. I think sometimes you look into like external safety, but it's like internally, can I create that safety um, in myself and be able to harness that trust, courage, compassion. And, and if that's a solid yes, even though fear, Fear is okay. Fear is always there, but always with fear comes courage. So knowing that, and especially when they're making very big decisions or something's really scary, I always know, all right, well, fear is here, but I know I have courage and the courage is always matching it, if not more. And um, fear really just shows how much you really care about something. And um, once you make that decision of a yes to you, then you can kind of dive into it. So that's why, you know, for me, at least, like, I've had many profound experiences, more than I've ever had with, with like, psychedelics, I'll be honest. And um, it's not really just about, about the plants, too. Like, when we say talking about plant medicine, it's really just that having it as an ally, like, being there as, like, a, an ally, but you still being the person to say yes to your full experience. Um, Yeah, so I really like how cacao can be that beautiful plant medicine, uh, plant ally and for sure. sure. Yeah, thanks for pulling through that, that terminology of plant ally. I think that's the way we should view any of these beautiful plant medicines that are being, you know, revealed to us and and that we're potentially working with. They really are allies. And I've had conversations with people that we've talked about really, you know, not always fully accrediting the medicine for the healing, because like you say, it's, it's an ally for you and it can only illuminate things and greater perspectives for you, but you have to be the one to say yes to that. You have to be the one to, uh, open up to that. Uh, if you wish to, to allow it to really heal and transform you. Yeah. And then at a point when your ally decides, Oh, okay my my service here is done right and we say goodbye again it's your choice of integration how are you really placing all of these profound things in your life and sometimes especially with me that's where western gets cut off there's no there's no support after um and you know in a lot of plant medicines and a lot of programs that's the same thing and even in spirituality there's no space for integration and process and i feel like that's actually a place i would love to solidify teaching and even like sharing with like my clients is that post because you can have this profound experience and like have you know all of these like aha moments but just making sure it's planted somewhere so it can process maybe not the next day not the next month the next maybe the next year the next two years but always remembering like um that possibility of uh wisdom that was already given to you is there and not to neglect that sense of um wisdom that was shared yes i i love the integration conversation i think it's very much needed i think spaces created for integration are are, are very much needed. And 
to really help us become the medicine that we are seeking, you know, I, and from your travels and from a lot of the trainings and things you've done, I know you've experienced the, you know, you go away for six weeks to India and then you come back, like there's an integration period that's needed. And I think for, for those of us that can resonate who someone who has gone away for some time on a, on a deeply inner transformative journey and then come back, almost sometimes it feels like people in our lives around us are they just think we just pop right back in and like we're like trying to really land our experience and you know we may need to slow down and create more space for ourselves and be really graceful with ourselves is something that I learned and just because things gotta land you know not only are we traveling physically across um you know miles and miles of 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 world but we are traveling energetically and spiritually we have to land and allow those new perspectives to really land in and integrate so to make space for that is really important yeah for sure and i feel like a lot of people when they get home from these profound experiences or even traveling and having like you know um going through some pilgrimage or journeys like when you come home it's very lonely um because like you said it's just you're back in a space that everyone else is in autopilot but then the sense of presence is now with you and you're you have this clarity of thinking and minding and that is where the hard work is because you you've already stepped out of the space of like your beliefs and you've been open you've been exposed in a way that um you've created this new sense of lens and then what it is, is when you're now stepped back with your family, with your friends, it almost is like you don't know them um, or like you don't connect with them anymore. And sometimes the hardest thing is that, wait, why can't I connect with them anymore? And you're thinking that you need to pull them up with you, but it's almost that sense of humbling. It's like, you no, no one's ever better than anyone just because you went through a healing. And that's something I really want to people, if there's a listener, it's like, just because someone's going through a healing journey, as a, as a person, you're no better than anyone and vice versa, they're, they're no better than you. I think that's really important to understand. It's, it's hard because you're, again, it's this relearning and re-understanding how you can act or how you can actually connect with people again in a space that you feel very true and authentic. Because I'll give an example. Um, when um, I came home, I... I for like let's just give an example I say I asked my dad to do all of these things for me do this do this do that and my father will always say yes always say yes and then part of my integration was I was actually stripping a lot of energy from my father because I asked him to do anything he'll drop anything to do it for me so part of it was like trying to learn how to do things on my own without this sense of codependency to my father that was a very hard time and for me I was just like but my dad's supposed to do this right these are belief systems that I was saying in my head but being able to go home and to respect another human being is the only way they can respect you so it's like sometimes we come in a role of like oh I'm this you know I know my boundaries, they're so strong. You do this, you're penetrating my boundary. Mm -hmm. But also understanding is just like, the reason why they are continuing doing it now is because you've built this sense of relationship where we've perpetuated this relationship of, you know, imbalance. But now it's like, can you use your voice to say, hey, like, I know this is what we've been doing before, but I would feel better if X, Y, and Z happened. And then creating boundaries, not a sense of, again, putting your wall up, but coming in a place of communication, mm-hmm. like proper communication. And I'm not saying it's easy again, but I think a lot of like this integration things, it's really learning to respect each other in a way. And it's not just about um, us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's it's like the communication and the relationship aspect um, is huge because you do notice those changes. And we, as as people going on these pilgrimages and these trainings and these inner transformative journeys too, when you come back, like you said, not not getting a big head or or thinking that it's all about us or that you know we're we're here to heal everyone. You know, my yoga teacher said at my training, she was like. Uh, we're not here to awaken the sheep. We're here to awaken the lion within each. And I, I say that a lot because we all have that lion and, and we're equally, you know, 
capable of accessing that. So it's not like we're here to shed light on everybody and, you know, come our way. It's, it's more meeting them where they are. And what I've found is like, like you're saying, setting my own personal boundaries, honoring those others boundaries and, and, you know, trying to find a meeting point between, Hey, if I'm asking for something, what do you need for me? You know, how can this be reciprocal and, yeah, just being soft and really generous for me. And like, after coming back from Guatemala, after all the cacao, like, I feel like my heart is opened in such a new way. Um, I'm walking softer. I'm, I'm in conversation with people much softer. And I think a huge thing too, is just back to the safety in the nervous system. When, when you're safe, when, cause we co-regulate together. And I know you can speak to this when you're safe with an individual and you're, you're grounded in your nervous system that it can help that person, especially if they're very fight or flighty all the time, which is a predominant, you know, majority of our population and not for wrong reasons. Like we're, we're just, that's how we are. And you can almost pull these people down and help them soften. And then, you know, the relationship could take on a whole new level. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, and I love that you use the word co-regulation because, um, that's like a beautiful, that's like a beautiful thing that people know that we are not alone to do like a healing or something. Um, especially when I was like, I told you about being 19 in this like deep dark hole. It's like at that pinnacle moment, like you really feel alone, like nothing else, no one else can like help you. But being able to know that co-regulation exists is that there is a sense of person or thing that you can actually be able to um, support and bring more balance and use like really good and for, for people to understand exists. Um, and I think that's when you can dabble in whatever modality or whatever it is that makes you feel really good, even if it's like a presence of a pet, a presence of a plant like that there's the capacity of co regulation there too. Um, it's just finding those foundations again finding those things that actually can support that co-regulation but yeah yeah finding those those self-soothing practices um and rituals and things that can really help you with that and i think another thing is too when you when you recognize the the individuals that you may be surrounding yourself with in your environment that either a an environment itself might be ungrounding and and you know, not very nourishing for your nervous system, but there, there might be certain people that you, you need to be careful with spending your time around, or you might find, you might know the right people who you can go to, who can really soften you, you know, the, the Eskimos in North America, they were really back in the day, this was kind of like a legend of the, the caribou and the wolf and that they're in a constant yin yang, <clears throat> you know, they're, so that people in our lives, it can be related to the caribou and the wolf because we have the wolf, some people that are making us stronger and testing us constantly. And then the caribou, the person who is fueling us, who is re-nourishing us, who is holding us soft space. So to recognize, because for a while I was always like trying to find caribou and like cutting the wolves out, but you have to embrace the duality because there's people here to, to trigger to actually trigger you for growth, like, and to test you. But there's also people here to, to really soften you and nourish you and to know that you need both of them um, in your life. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, that sense of safety is really like, at least for me as a practitioner is like my biggest goal is um, what does safety look like to you? It could be different for absolutely everyone. And I think my biggest part of the, my own healing journey is how to rediscover safety. And um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's definitely a journey on, um, like you said, co-regulation, but also understanding your nervous system as an individual around people um and once you can rediscover your safety again no matter what chaotic environments are around um knowing that that sense of safety is still just really within is super important and you know i've gone through 
like I had mentioned before, like I've gone through many um, parts in my life where I wasn't safe from the age of like six to 18 in my life. And um, because I was always in a state of, um, what's the word, defense, or almost I was always like in alert. And once I could, could anchor myself, through all of these modalities, all these practices to relearn myself um, and to find that sense again of light is what you're saying and mentioning before. Darkness, there there has to be darkness and light, same duality. So when you're a light worker, or you're, you're wanting to share all of these amazing things, there's darkness around. It's really pushing through that darkness and letting and reminding others know that that light still exists. But all of that darkness is still there and it's totally fine. It can still be there, but we still feel very safe because, um, you know, we've, we've created this strong foundation within ourselves. Um, so yeah, for sure. What do you think are a couple practical, um, tips or advice, like when just trying to kind of recognize what nourishment versus, you know, unnourished or like regulation versus dysregulation might look like like do you have any certain practices you'd like to share yeah i mean i'll do a simple one um at the end of the day um can i can i easily recite my day or is it difficult and that's like a really quick one um for me to check in because sometimes the day really flies and i actually was not present at all and i didn't give my pauses and there are other times where I can really count the four or five pauses I've given myself. And if at a consistently consistent point that I realize at the end of my um, days, asking myself that and, oh, I don't remember, I don't remember. It's a very quick, oh, I don't remember. It's too difficult for me to even think about my day. That is where I'm no longer nourished. Um, so then I have to kind of come back where like, all right, the biggest question, and I think it's a beautiful question I actually use to be my clients, where did my energy leak today? And when I asked that question, to be very real with yourself, work was leaking to me, or um, this fight with my friend was leaking, or something like that. Um, but when you can say, where am I leaking today? It's almost that that sort of um, leak is where I is my priority. It's what I need to actually focus on because everything else is just like a to do to do task. And then once I can identify almost that leak, it's like, what's my action to actually plug the leak? Just because you can't, you know, if, if you have a bucket of water and there's a hole, no matter how much you're pouring in there, it's just going to come back out. So that is like a very big question, very easy. You don't have to do anything. And um, is to ask yourself every day at the end of the day, or even at the end of the week, where's my energy, uh, where's my energy leaking? And um, that's like a very simple to kind of know if you feel nourished or, or it's just like a sense of overwhelm. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, of course. Because I can, I can relate in my own life and at certain parts of my life, especially like in the past two years of sometimes getting in almost such a flow and just such a, you know, one thing after the next, after the next, after the next, that it almost perpetuates on itself. And that I found myself so undernourished and I was wondering why my mood was affected, why I was, you know, irritable, why I couldn't, why I had brain fog and all these things. It was, it was because I wasn't making time for those spaces and that integration and really ultimately I wasn't regulated in my nervous system and I had forgot what that had felt like. So really being reminded and, and illuminated upon how important regulation in the nervous system is and feeling safe. And obviously, like you pointed to at the beginning, not always, you know, out of fight or flight, but honoring the fight or flight stage as pivotal to our day and our productivity. And like, obviously we have it for a reason, but learning how to throttle and, and shift gears when we need to. And when a lot of times recently, and I know you can resonate with this, we were saying we're just very opportunity rich at the moment. There's a lot of things coming in, all good things, right? But 
I've noticed at the end of my days, I'm trying to just create space for like two, three hours to to journal, to reflect on my week, on my month, on my day, to to smudge, um, maybe sit with Rape, just to kind of land um, in in. I wouldn't say turbulent times, but like times where it feels like a lot of stuff is coming through. And I think, Your pause. yeah, that's my pause. And I think a lot of us right now can resonate with, there's a lot of opportunities out there. And I don't know if it's because we're like in the Aries energy or something, but <laughs> <laughs> I do want to actually mention um, that I really use the word pause because the word rest actually triggered me um when someone told me to rest i almost didn't feel like i because of the type of person i am it's just like if i'm not doing more i'm not getting anywhere and it's a really hard belief that even till this day i always get reminded like or i always have to remind myself or my therapist tells me remember what you always say to yourself i don't have to keep reaching to get more and whatever it may be because i feel this sense of like not enough but having that shift in language really really made a profound experience in my healing and also that's where it's just like your language towards yourself what are the things you're saying to yourself um and what do you want to say to yourself um and i think part of these pauses is when you can start to um create this sense of conversation that is more nourishing and that's where also I feel like is a nice practical space is like when you are doing your pause, like, are you being nice or are you being mean to yourself and being able to just kind of shift gears? And that's a hard practice, but it's a practice. It's like, can you shift to say something nice to yourself? And most people actually feels quite weird. Oh, I love you. You are so beautiful. You are so sexy. Some people would cringe because they're like, oh, I'm not sexy. I'm not beautiful. But it's like almost like embracing those pinnacle moments and and then when a harder moment comes, because you've already consistently said those beautiful and strengthening and empowering things to yourself, when the hard moments come, that's your test. And it's okay, even if you've not to say fail this test, but say, okay, you you what you you went back to the same pattern. Totally fine. That's the grace that you spoke about earlier. Okay, next time this opportunity comes again, I will be more empowering to myself. And that's just a life and a learning experience. And um, that word pause really said, okay, I'm pausing, but I'm not technically stopping what I'm doing in life. So also rebuilding this sense of language is super important um, that I feel people need for their mental and also understanding the language of your body. Another beautiful practice is just like, how does your body feel? Is it tight? Is it hurting? And if it's a yes, and you're thinking that's the norm, part of the practice is, all right, why don't you sit back and find the roots of that? Or like, are you taking care or even acknowledging the part of your body that speaks? Because our body talks to us. It's just in the matter of understanding, getting to know that language of the body. And um, yeah. yeah, very beautiful. Thank you for pulling that through. Um, what words of encouragement do you have for those on their self-healing journey? Well, I said one and I always say it. And then and the biggest thing is that you are not alone. You are not alone. Um, and embrace expansion is another thing i think sometimes we really fear we're, we're always yearning for like a healing or you know always again same going for the more, more or trying to fix things but like really expanding into whatever it is and whatever place you're in and um yeah i think those are the two main ones that i feel like i would say it's like you are never alone and it's just this open expansion embracing it fully sure. would you say also um just you know the patient side of things you know because you said you've been on your journey for 10 years now for me it's been like three it's like to understand that it 
it may seem like it's never going to get better or that it yeah. may never heal, but you know, we, we got to be patient with this process and, and. Yeah. Also, you know, the biggest one actually now that we're like really just understanding because of that word healing, not to forget to live, if that makes sense in a way that we're always healing and we can get very caught into it, but don't forget to live like the mundane should look a little bit brighter. The mundane should actually feel really good. And when I'm saying mundane, it's like drinking this cup of water, going for a walk, looking at your plants, washing the dishes, um, being able to embrace the little things because those are also part of your, uh, in this sense of like healing, is that living too is there. So enjoyment exists. And sometimes when we use that word like trauma work or shadow work or whatever it may be, um, it's really, again, encompassing everything as a whole. It's like, how, what are things too that bring me true joy? Like not forgetting those parts and aspects of your life when you're going through something like this, because you've been strong for so long, you don't always have to be strong for so long. And I think um, sometimes we forget that. And once you can really start to dabble back into those things that bring your heart in and blossom it a little bit more that blossoming of life and being able to be like oh i'm here because i can do this i can i can create this i can um, embody this and that is where true expansion can happen is when you can hold both at the same time and yeah just don't forget to live <laughs> yeah i think that's really powerful advice because i was definitely victim to the to the narrow lens of, you know, just so enveloped in my self-healing and the work, you know, doing the work and like that there was, I, I almost for a while was in this place, like there was this destination I had to reach. There was this, this place, this, this ladder I had to climb. And then once I got there, it was just all going to be okay. Everything was going to be healed. But then to realize, no, this is a lifelong journey and we we're going to keep coming around to similar things at new perspectives and at deeper levels it's all just a spiral in nature and so like you said to embrace the things that bring us joy and to relish in in living and not always um just so enveloped in our healing process because that actually is profoundly healing in itself when we can you know just sit there and wash the dishes as you know this beautiful activity and just sit with our plants or like lay with our dog and almost do these things like we did when we were a kid with that imagination and that wonder exactly i i truly believe that i mean i guess that's where a lot of the inner child work comes from it's like finding what you did as an inner child and i completely agree with that um, however, it's like you can enjoy new things as an adult too. And it's also exploring and, and expanding in that space. And what does that look like to you? Um, and really understanding and encompassing. Yes, I love this as a child. I, I, I want to do that, but build that curiosity, build that exploration as a, you know, as an adult now. And what does that look like? And um, so many opportunities and so much more depth you can connect when you're with yourself that um the biggest thing too is another piece of advice is that when your nervous system is flexible um it's a humbling experience to know that you have the capacity to to accept that when you are frozen or dissociated or feeling a certain way that that's not a bad thing either it's just like that's the place you're at right and and it's not neglecting the sadness and the, the lower vibration emotions but being able to say that exists and not just strive for happiness and and again joy and everything's happy but like knowing that everything exists and is okay and almost giving that sense of permission um you are angry like and I think uh, I moved through a lot of anger in my life 
and accepting that anger is part of me. And what does that look like to release? How can I bring this sense of anger into passion? And it's just energy. It's like that. Yeah. It's energy moving. And um, and we associate especially anger with more like negative actions. However, anger is like a beautiful ang- uh, space, especially, you know, when I ex- talk about like the darkness of chocolate, right? That sense of anger comes from a passionate space. It's really learning how to move that energy in a more positive impact with the people around you and um, things like that. So uh, really just embracing everything as a whole when it comes to like emotions and um yeah yeah embracing the whole emotional spectrum Mm. learning how to sit with it honor each emotion and channel it towards um something that can can lead to you know some transformation some alchemy but also sometimes maybe not maybe just truly sitting with it and just just being with it and being really curious yeah, a hundred percent. And this is, I don't know if like you agree, but um, at least for me, as I've started to work with like hundreds of people and like even having like my own self journey, I had realized that I separated the words like emotions and feelings. And um, I no longer actually share with people. Um, I want you to feel your feelings um, just because when I was like researching on like the word and just the depth and like when someone says that it's very confusing because most people are like, what do you mean feel my feelings, right? And um, part of a lot of the teaching I do is like understanding the difference between feelings and emotions actually. Like emotions are very quick, um, 40 seconds, you know, they can energy move through your body. However, feelings is like a combination of that, but with belief systems. And sometimes uh, feelings can be, you know, not misguided. However, it's, it's part of like the healing is understanding the depths of the feelings with your connected with beliefs and how to consistently work with the emotions currently at hand. Um, so, you know, when, it, when we talk about feelings, it's very tricky because there's a sense of unsafety sometimes there because people actually don't like those feelings that are coming up present because of how their lens are growing up or what relationships they're in. And it's very miscued. So sometimes, especially when I work with a lot of like um, trauma um, clients that we feelings is like the last thing we do and emotions because it's very um, jarring to the nervous system. So it's really, again, when it comes to safety, it's like safety in the body and recognizing the language of your body first. And then after knowing that, then inviting what, oh, what what thoughts or uh, emotions come up? And then naturally they express feelings. Um, and then from there, because they already know how to create safety in their body, your body's your first messenger. So when you can calm it down physically, your mind can actually have a little bit of ease and clarity to move through. But I thought it was just like interesting how as time goes by, I was always say, okay, you gotta feel your feelings. But then as at a point I was like, it's actually not nourishing in the beginning of your healing journey. It's you have to create a safe container for your physical aspect and then be able to know when to get yourself out because our feelings can be very misconstrued um, and being able to identify like emotions from that. Yeah. So to cap off the show, I like to ask when you hear the words live thrivingly, what comes to your mind? Uh, the word comes like wholeness. Like I feel like the word wholeness when you're just like living thrivingly, it's like you're encompassing again, expansion and feeling so whole. Um, and that there's this sense of built resilience. Is how I feel when you're living just thrivingly. Amazing. I love that. So China, where can the listeners out there connect with you? Um, 
most of my social media is really just Instagram. Um, so on Instagram, it's at C H Y N N A D E E. So it's China D. Um, and from there, I really that's where I share the Ayurveda yoga massage and neurogenic yoga part of my life and just kind of the journey that I've been going through on the past couple of years. Um, and I work, like you mentioned before, in Yonkers, New York. I see clients there one on one, but I also see people on Zoom if they are interested in the neurogenic yoga or trauma release exercises and also breath work. So the breath work can also be done through online. And yeah, and then I share the Sage Cacao Company. It is an e-commerce, so we ship all in the US. However, um, we share cacao circles and collaborations with local studios here or cafes to help support our community and also um, the farmers that we source from. And that's how we see people in person. Amazing. And you can find Sage Cacao on Instagram at Sage Cacao, correct? And uh, there's a website for Sage Cacao as well, but also you have a website for your one-on-ones? Yeah, it's, uh, I will send it to you. It's on, it's really just the link that's in my bio for my Instagram. It's on like a beacon website. So I, simplicity for me is the easiest way. So I actually don't have a full website and we're primarily like word of mouth. So um, I don't really put a lot of the things I work with through Google. Um, so yeah, I'm sure the link will be in um, the bio below. Uh, yes, um, you can definitely check below in the description for all these links to these beautiful resources that China provides with her offerings. Um, thank you so much for coming on today for your for your vulnerability, for your for your heart, for your soul. Before we go, do you have any last words? Thank you so much for having me here. You are such a blessing to have met this year, and I am excited to see you flourish and to see you just live thrivingly. Thank you so much. Aho. Thank you. Thank you.